All right. Hello, hello. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the second session of the MakerPad Community Program. One moment. I'm going to bring up our speaker today, Steph Smith from the Hustle and Trends. Steph, let's see if we can get you on stage. As always, hey. this is, apologies. I, yeah, I thought you were going to be in a different waiting room, but um, yeah, good, good to see you. Good to see everybody. Uh, welcome to this Q and A, Steph. Uh, how, how's your day been? It's good. Sorry about the delay, everyone. Uh, Zoom webinars. I host them for our community as well. They're surprisingly hard to get right. Yeah, there's always a lot of different buttons everywhere. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. But Stephanie, I thought we'd start with kind of just kicking off with your background and and how you got to uh, trends and the hustle. So yeah, if you want to just give people a bit of your background and. Again, you can ask questions in the chat. I will be helping moderate that. There's also a circle channel that people can jump into and ask questions and I'll be uh, feeding you some questions from. But uh, yeah, let's kick off with just a bit of your background. Sure, um, I don't know how far back we wanna go. I did a degree in chemical engineering, switched to consulting, then found myself uh, working on the growth team for a tech company. Um, while on the growth team, I ended up getting promoted to lead the publications team. So that was really like my intro into marketing, a lot more about writing online, things like that. And then uh, throughout that time, I started working on my own projects, including my own blog. Uh, Sam, the founder of The Hustle, ended up um, seeing some of my stuff and kind of, you know, the magic of the internet, uh, reached out to me, said, hey, I want you at The Hustle. And it was the perfect timing. I was ready to leave my current role. And so ended up joining The Hustle um, at the beginning as an analyst for trends. So mostly writing for the product. And then uh, a couple months ago, switched to leading the product. So yeah, that's how I got here. Yeah, the ma the magic of the internet, uh, putting out yeah. content, and then getting getting pulled into interesting projects. And, exactly. Um, for people who don't really know the hustle or trends, I mean, I think they're they're pretty popular. Do you want to give people just a bit of background on on how the company started and then um, where it is today? Sure. So Sam actually started the company um, several years ago as uh, an event business. He kind of recognized that, um, you know, if he wanted to, he had moved to San Francisco many, many years ago. If he wanted to kind of get to know other exciting entrepreneurs or people doing cool things, the easiest way to do so is say, hey, I'm going to run an event. Like, will you come speak at my event? And so he started HustleCon. It was super profitable. And then he realized, you know, if I want to make this really big, if I want it to reach a lot of people, um, he decided he was going to turn it into a media business, which took form in an email newsletter, which probably is how most people know of the hustle today. It's a daily email that reaches over a million people about business and tech. Um, and so that was a natural evolution. But um, if people in this audience aren't familiar with uh, email newsletters, there's really a ceiling to, you know, how big an email newsletter can get. Hustle is already on that kind of top end. And so, of course, he, he a year or two ago decided or considered what's next after this email newsletter or how can we expand the business further. And then um, what he did there is said, you know, what is you know, for all the people who are reading our email newsletter, they're trying to get their business in tech news. What's like the next step in terms of what that type of person, what that audience really wants or needs. And so he found that, you know, a lot of people just like him are constantly researching business ideas. They're constantly trying to start their own businesses. They're constantly trying to invest in businesses. So he said, you know what, um, there's not really a publication that focuses on not so much what's going on today, but, but what's going to be happening in the next couple of years or the future. And that's what trends basically is. It's all about spotting trends before they happen or really as they're on the verge of taking off and how you can capitalize. And so he recognized that um, this publication was again, kind of a step closer to what people really, really wanted, um, kind of that acute problem that they might be facing. So he charged for it. And this is um, the Hustle's premium publication. Uh, which again, I, I currently run now and um, it's grown super fast. So Hustle Daily has a million subscribers. Trends has um, several thousand paying subscribers um, and it's an annual membership for $2.99. So yeah, that's a little bit about the company and what, what we do now. Yeah, I think it's a common story that somebody has an interest. Um, they share about that interest through content. Other people find that person and then um, you kind of develop a community around that. I think Part of the discussion today that'll be interesting is just digging into how you shift from uh, content to community, because I think a lot of people, they think about um, you know community building and they think, oh, I should just kick off immediately uh, with a community. I should just start a Slack group or start a Facebook group. And you can do that, but um, I think there's something to this kind of 
um, producing content to sort of figure out what type of person might be attracted to the community. And it sounds like part of trends as well is um, continuing content. So it's not just community, it's going deeper with the content as well. So um, yeah, maybe you could speak a little bit to that transition from uh, content to community. Yeah, exactly. So I think sometimes um, the problem with starting a community from the get-go is A, you need some sort of filtering mechanism to actually make sure that you're bringing the right people into the community that have similar interests. I mean, you can say I'm creating a community for X, but um, it's really hard to then like either um, distribute or, or find those individuals that fit your community and actually have those needs. Um, but then also you need, when you start a community, you tend to need like a a certain foundation for the community to thrive, right? Like you can start a, a Slack channel and if there's three people in there, I'm, I've been in some of these and they die out pretty quickly, right? So there's kind of this like similar to a marketplace, like you need a certain base uh, for a community to work. And so for that reason, starting a community just from scratch without any sort of like prior um, distribution mechanism or filtering mechanism is really, really hard to do. It can be done, but it's really, really hard to do. And so if you start with something like information that can reach way more people, right? Because think about it. The other thing about communities is most of the time they're closed off, right? So the value is closed off within there. So it's hard to actually showcase a potential person that wants to be in that community, what they'll get. And so what The Hustle did and many other companies do is they create, again, some sort of, as you mentioned, information or content-based stream to a reach more people first but also simultaneously in some way filter those individuals to again with the hustle as an example that we're filtering through the hustle in terms of people who are interested in business and tech and so that once they get into that community it's it's a thriving community with people who all have similar problems who can help one another so that's kind of how it happened with the hustle and it's interesting because now we often find that Many people still to this day come in because they say they want a particular type of information or because they you know, really wanted this article. They tend to come in for the information, but they tend to stick around for the community. So now it kind of plays this dual role of not just being part of the product, but really keeping people within the product. Yeah, I think that's a really good insight, which is um, it's difficult to showcase the value of a community sometimes. And so it's much easier to describe, oh, here's some premium content you're going to get. You're likely the person who already loves our content and you want to go deeper. By the way, there's also this community. And so uh, when people actually, uh, when they kind of go through the paywall, they're getting their content, then they see the community. Can you describe the experience a little bit that you've created for people? Because I'm curious, um, you kind of say like they, they come for the content, stay for the community. I'm kind of curious what that looks like in terms of either onboarding or what the value they start to see is in the community. Like, oh, I, now I see that um, here's this community I can do X you know, with. Sure. And yeah, and just to touch on your point about how communities are, um, or sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, but to get back to your question, actually. So the onboarding that we have is basically someone starts trends, they get access to a certain amount of information, which is really what they're coming in for. And then with respect to Facebook, which is where our community is housed, they get, almost immediately get a prompt to join the Facebook group, but also throughout the onboarding emails, they get um, introduced to different ways to use the community. So one of the things that, you know, these are not special to trends, but we encourage people to introduce themselves almost immediately, you know, ask the community if they have any um, problems that they want to be solved, if they need to be connected anywhere. Um, Sam does a really good example or does a really good job of setting an example of how the community should be used. And I think this is actually something that I often see not done well in communities is, you know, someone starts a community and they basically just expect people to use it in a specific way, or they set up very specific rules, right? Like these are the, you know, moderation guidelines or whatever, but they don't actually show people what good engagement looks like, right? They're not like setting an example for how people should use the community. So we don't actually have that many rules within the trans community, but Sam in particular and other part members of our team very intentionally go in and just set an example for like the types of things that you should post in the community. They show people what gets engagement. So then people kind of, you know, just use that as a way to understand how to leverage the community um, best. Of course, like in onboarding, we show people, this is how you search, this is how you post, this is, you know, here are some examples of great community posts, et cetera. But I think actually the most underrated thing um, that Sam has done is again, showing people how to utilize the community um, effectively. And then people kind of just, you know, leverage that and start executing in that way. 
Just out of curiosity, what do you see as some of those value like propositions? Is is he modeling um, how to connect with other people? Is he modeling how to share information and you know his own I guess spin on what that means to him? Like, I think I'd be curious just to hear what you feel like some of those value points are that that he's modeling. Yeah, so some of the things that Sam consistently does within the community is one, he'll call out members, right? So sometimes, you know, certain members join who have a lot of expertise and he'll say, hey, like we have this new member. No, I think he asks them first, but he says, hey, we've got this new member. They're an expert in X. Maybe they're like a lawyer for startups or maybe they're the, you know, we recently had like the president of Shopify join who knows a lot clearly about e-commerce and stuff like that. It's not always big names, but anyone that he's like, oh, the, like the community can benefit from this person. And the reason that works is because it's rare that someone in the community is going to step up and say, hey, everyone, I'm an expert in X, because uh, I mean, that sounds a little conceited, first of all, but also um, it's just not something you typically see people do. So he, first of all, calls out these people and says, hey, this person's in the community, like any questions for them, like how can they help you guys? Another thing he very consistently does, and if you've ever heard the podcast, My First Million, um, it's just all about them kind of riffing on ideas and sharing ideas and um, he basically does the equivalent of my first million in the community. So he'll be like, oh, I stumbled on this business. I ended up searching, um, you know, their financials. Here they are, if you can get access to them. Um, and he'll just basically do a like mental dump uh, into, into the chat about everything he researched. And then people will just kind of riff on that. And then you consistently see, um, the reason I'm calling these out is because you consistently see people end up doing that now, right? So, so many people in the community will now be like, oh, I stumbled upon this company. Has anyone heard of this? I think these are their competitors, but like, what do you think? Is there opportunity here? And so the community is really fostered around this idea of just like openly sharing and providing value um, versus I often see in certain other business communities, people just like promoting their own stuff or, you know, trying to get sales. And that really, of course, it happens in trends as it happens everywhere. But I see that less because, again, Sam kind of set an example of the type of engagement that um, is rewarded in the community. Yeah, I think that's amazing. It really speaks to kind of helping curate um, the group and the conversation. And it, another lesson there is just that it it takes a lot of work to, to lead a community. It's not just something you can do passively. And um, I think leading by example is a, is a great, um, you know, point on that. We have a, we have a question from Circle from Victor who uh, couldn't attend. He says, uh, if you were to prepare uh, a launch of a product with a target audience, matching slash matching jobs of an existing strong non-commercial community. Let me see if I can answer this live and you can see it. Um, such as 100k strong uh, subreddit, uh, Discord channels with a couple thousand users, etc. How would you start pulling them in? So I think what he's asking here is, you know, if you're to prepare a launch of a product, and you've got a target demo, how would you go into some other community like a subreddit or a Discord channel to start kind of bringing them over? And then he says, would you start on their own turf and create value there? Uh, drive them to your website and collect emails in exchange for a free X? Would you build a parallel community to start uh, owning the relationship? Um, so yeah, I think it's a question about, you have an idea um, you know, for a community, how do you work with an existing community to sort of pull value or, or people and members over? Yeah, that's a good parsing of the question because I was reading it and I was like, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I understand. I'll look at these, yeah. yeah, but actually this actually reminds me of some, what I was going to say when I lost my train of thought in that um, here, like as you're trying to basically, again, move people into your community, something really important to consider is that when you think of different products out there, whether it's community or information or a physical product, everything has a perceived value, right? And community, this is what I was gonna mention earlier, has a low perceived value. It's one of those things, as you mentioned, like once you're in it, you're like, ooh, this is really valuable. But when you see it on a landing page or you see it, someone tells you about it, you're less likely to be like, I need that, right? Cause it's more of that, you know, are you a vitamin or are you a painkiller? Um, information tends to be more of a painkiller. Um, community tends to be more of a vitamin. And so for that reason, to answer your question, there's many ways to bring people into a community, but what I would say definitely not to do, it's to do you know, a direct conversion landing page where you're saying, hey everyone, like I have this new community. Cause again, the perceived value on an additional community is gonna be very, very low, um, at least at the beginning before someone has experienced it or heard about it from other people. And so what I would say is a couple things. One, you should start out by um, fostering your community in some way, either, by actually identifying people who are perfect for your community, reaching out to them, being saying, hey, this is what I'm trying to create. Be super open. This is like super early on. I want to give you free access. I want to see if this works. That's one way to do it. 
The other way is kind of how, how it happened with trends where you have to find some sort of distribution mechanism outside of the community itself, which can be through information. It can be through selling some sort of you know, digital product that ends up solving a problem for the right type of users. Um, so any of anything that can basically get people interested in what you're building and then have the community be part of that, but not the thing that you're selling. Again, it can be the, the reason that people stick around, but it's I find that it's very rare that people actually are willing to put up significant amounts of money for a straight up community, especially if it's, it's kind of new and more greenfield. Um, and so if you're operating in a space where you actually there is an existing community, um, let's say again on subreddit or discord or somewhere where people are already happy in some way, consider what those individuals um, may need that they're not getting in that current community and leverage that. And so maybe on the subreddit, they don't actually have the ability to directly chat with people. So maybe you consider starting a Telegram chat, a Slack channel, but even past that, um, I'm not sure what your, sounds like you, maybe you're a job matching uh, service or something like that. Um, I'm not sure, but you can consider for people who want that, what's basically, what's the information that those people would need? Or what's again, a tool that I can create that those people need to get those people in, solve a pain point, a more acute pain point for them. So they're more likely to engage with you and your, you know, your um, likelihood to convert them is higher. And then again, keep them there through the community, but don't have that as the direct sale, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think this speaks to almost like a patience a little bit as well around like building yeah. up momentum and and um, defining and finding the right people who are going to be in your community. I think, you know, it, it feels like we want to make this rush and just get like a lot of people in the door. And I think part of the lesson it sounds like is that through curating the content, through attracting the right people, uh, the hustle and trends had a, an easier time really converting and building a strong community because they put in a lot of work prior. Um, so maybe there's exactly. like a little bit of a, a patience aspect there. Um, yeah, and recommend anyone else who has questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or in the um, Q&A feature, should be something there as well. Um, there's an attendee, I'm going to pull a question from, uh, which is, uh, is Facebook, it's a good transition here, is Facebook a good place to nurture a community or would you use another platform if you were starting a new one today? It's a great question. Um, we have had so many requests from the trans community to move off Facebook because people tend to not be uh, a very big fan of the company itself. But speaking just from the perspective of how well the tool works, right, how, how well it services the community, I think it's the best tool. And that's, you know, I personally don't have a great, um, you know, view of Facebook as a company, but in terms of how it services us, it, I think it does the best job. So I've um, been in communities on Slack, Telegram, Circle, Facebook, of course, um, all different type Discord. Um, there's pros and cons to each community. Something you want to keep in mind is first, how big is your community and how big do you expect it to get? So when you're small, things like WhatsApp or Telegram can work because they're all one kind of synchronous chat, right? Where like everything's going on, there's no threads, you can't have, um, you know, you're not in a forum where you can have particular threads about certain topics, Slack, you have different types of channels. But so when you're really small, that can work. If you get any bigger than a couple hundred, some of those like telegrams start to break down. So that's the first thing to consider. The second thing to consider is how likely are people to engage with that particular application? And what I mean by that, the reason that Facebook has been so good for us, and it's in addition to having that more asynchronous forum-like functionality, um, when I, so for example, I'm in communities on circle, I am never going to circle just because, right? I'm only going to go to circle if I get a notification and it's very rare that I'll open up any of these communities just because I happen to, to want to do that. Now, what happens with Facebook, and we actually did a survey within our community to check is how many people actually see these trends posts because they're going to the community versus because they happen to be on Facebook. They happen to be on their newsfeed, for example, just you know, doing their, their daily thing. And what we found is actually a surprising number of them, more than half, just see the trends post because they happen to be on their newsfeed and they happen to be scrolling. And so you happen to get, at least from what we've seen, way more engagement, because again, a lot of people who wouldn't natively go and check the community, who just happen to be on Facebook are going in and actually engaging with those posts because they see them in their timeline. The other thing to consider is just purely how many of your audience or what percentage of your audience actually has those applications overall. So something that I did recently for a smaller community that I'm running is I went on Telegram, but I, you know, I know that some percentage of that community 
it doesn't even have Telegram. So that's something to consider, right? With Facebook, you're going to have like 90 plus percent of the people who you're trying to attract that at least have the application, right? So there's pros and cons. You want to consider how big is your community? Do you want it synchronous or asynchronous? I think asynchronous tends to be better, especially at scale, because again, you don't want just some continuous chat because people need to be able to find the best stuff or the stuff that is most relevant to them. So whether that's through channels on Slack or whether that's through types of posts or subgroups within something like Facebook. Um, but to get back to your original question, um, at least for us, we have found that Facebook is the best place um, to nurture a community because of some of that kind of passive engagement where someone's not actively saying, hey, I want to engage in the trends group. And they just happen to be on Facebook and they happen to engage there. Um, and again, because you know, 90 plus percent of people who would purchase our product have Facebook. So there's no kind of friction there for them to go download another app for them to be able to engage. And so, yeah, that's what I would say. Um, of course, there's no exact right answer, but Facebook was has been a great um, tool for us and uh, we have no plans on switching. Yeah, it sounds like it scales really well. Um, and I think one thing that's sort of interesting that I'd be curious about is you, you were sharing that um, you, you've had some pretty amazing people join. Like I, I think you said the CEO of Shopify or so, someone really high up at Shopify. Um, do, you, do you have any sense about how they feel joining a community like that? Like I'm kind of curious around curation and I don't know if on Facebook people have like direct access to them. Um, it, you know, is there anything, I guess, interesting there around Facebook as a platform um, and having people feel like, oh, this is like giving a bunch of people access to me or something like that? That's really, that's a really interesting question. Um, it's not something that at least from what I've encountered has been an issue with us, but I would say that um, it depends also on the quality of your community and trends is a, you know, $299 product, which kind of, it filters people out, right? It, not all people, but it tends to filter out people who are just in there to like, you know, be spammy or to go and like, you know, mass email everyone in the group and things like that. And obviously we, we take precautions to prevent some of that stuff. But I think something that people should keep in mind in general is your price point is not just, you know, how much you charge and how much you make, but it's, it in itself is a filtering mechanism for um, potentially the quality of your community. And we've benefited from that to where, you know, the CEO of Shopify is not the only kind of big name that is, is in the trends group. Um, and at least from what I've seen, we haven't really had difficulty in convincing those people to join. But I also think people treat their Facebooks as less personal these days. Like, it, it, even if people DM them, like, they're not going to see it, they're not going to respond. And so it's not like giving out your email or giving out your phone number. I think people in general are less, you know, touchy about that versus what, what may have been true maybe five or 10 years ago. Yeah, I think that affects scale too, because if you don't feel that way, then the more people, the better. Um, and if you do feel that way, then you don't want to see scale if you're someone like the CEO of Shopify, because then it's kind of like scary because it's like, oh man. Um, but you're right. I think people are also naturally getting better at, at kind of filtering that type of thing out. I, I just want to highlight, I think this lesson today on unperceived value has been a running thread that's just been uh, really interesting, both the perceived value of um, content versus community, um, how price changes perceived value. I think that's another really good uh, takeaway as well, just for, for curation. One area we haven't um, jumped into yet, and again, feel free to ask questions if anyone else wants to, to ask anything directly to, to Steph, happy to um, you know, bring that question into the conversation. But one, one thing that I think we haven't really discussed a ton yet is we talked about kind of content attracting a community. We talked about uh, content attracting customers to the community. Um, I haven't really heard much about how it actually kind of overlaps or like weaves into the community experience. And so, you know, when it comes to the Facebook group, just because, you know, I've never been in it before, or maybe other people haven't either, how crucial or like how much of a bedrock is the content in the Facebook? Um, and how does it even overlap with your strategy? I imagine having 7,000 people to share a blog post with first is actually really good for amplifying the other aspect of the business. So yeah, I'm just curious about the overlap. Sure. So yeah, the at the beginning, things I think were a little bit different in the community than they are today in that, you know, similar to what I was saying at the beginning, where if you have less people in a community, you're just going to have less engagement and you're going to have a heavier lift, especially if you're running that community to get it to be thriving in this like um, engaging place where people want to continue coming back. And so at the beginning, we did le definitely leverage a lot of our content more. Um, Sam posted a lot more. I posted a lot more because 
again, if, if we weren't doing it, like who was going to do it, right? And so we did leverage a lot of the content that we published in Trends and be like, hey, we wrote this article about non-alcoholic beer and how it's growing. Like, what do people think? Um, so we would definitely leverage the content there. But these days, we don't really post much about what happens in the email. Um, we let the email kind of do its thing, deliver value. And then because there's so many people in the community now, um, we actually, we, we're kind of facing a new problem, which is interesting in that when you have such a big community, um, it's very hard for people to actually find the best stuff or the stuff that's most, most relevant to them. So we're actually, you know, we all still post in that community, but we're having to do less of that legwork. And now it's become an issue of more like, how do we make sure that only the best stuff gets published or shared? How do we moderate this more effectively? Do we create subgroups? There's all these new questions that have popped up, but um, to get back to your question, we don't as much uh, publish you know, the things that are from the email and the group as much, partially just because we don't need to as much anymore. Yeah, that's a great uh, model for people who are starting out. If your community feels like crickets, you know, not many people are, uh, are maybe engaging instead of posting all the time, just directly saying, okay, hey guys, what's up? Or, you know, it, you can kind of avoid that. It sounds like by publishing content, which can then spur, um, spur conversations. And then over time, that content can be pulled back as other people's content starts um, being elevated. Uh, and then there's new problems, like you said, when you hit scale. Uh, let's jump into a question or two from the audience. Uh, this question is, uh, how much time does your team spend in the Facebook group to put together the trends newsletter? I really love how you bring your community into your content. Whenever I read it, it makes me feel like I'm missing out not being in the group. Yeah, good question. So for context, for those who aren't trend subscribers, we have the weekly email, which is all about, that's where the trends product started. It's all about these kind of like signals or flares that are, you know, about to surge. Um, and so it's more of an informational product of like, here are the things that you should know about that perhaps you don't know. But then we have a biweekly uh, community focused email, which is basically we recognized over time that this community feature within the product was something that people really cared about, really liked um, engaging with. And so we created this biweekly community newsletter that features somewhere between five to 10 different stories from within the community that week. And what we do there is this is another kind of benefit of Facebook that I would say isn't essential, but is, is super nice is that in Facebook, you can actually export um, a bunch of analytics and you can see within a 30 day period at any time what the most highly engaged posts were. Um, and so that provides a very, very kind of quick way for us to scan down. We don't always just share the top post, the one with the most engagement, but for us to scan and be like, wow, these are the posts that people really care about. And then from there, what our team does is go and reach out to those community members, do a more like one-on-one -on -one interview um, to get more of the information, more of the story. And then we publish it in this, this community newsletter. But to answer the question about how long it takes, really not that long at all. I mean, I think we could probably publish or who, we switch who's working on it uh, every so often, but whoever's working on it can, you know, kind of do all the interviews, find the posts and publish the thing in like a day. Um, and so, yeah, I agree that I think um, we have, so we do NPS on our newsletters and the community newsletter tends to have the highest NPS relative to the normal newsletter, which we were surprised by because the original newsletter was like, you know, our bread and butter and what we started with. Um, but people seem to really like the community stories and it also serves as kind of this filtering mechanism. If people can't check the Facebook group all the time, they just get this email and they can see kind of like the, the weekly download of what is most important. Yeah, I love that um, it kind of starts with the um, trends hustle brain, but then there's kind of this like group brain that almost is surfacing stuff that people find interesting in a different way. And you can just kind of like leverage that and uh, translate it to something else. Um, and plus I'm sure that digest, like I think that question kind of mentioned, prompts people to jump back in. They feel like they're missing out. Um, and uh, just to clarify for that, and I think it's going to lead in this question, is that Community Digest, is that um, free for everybody or is that only sent to paid community members? It's just for the Trends product. So it's specifically, product, yeah. we have an ambassador community Facebook group, um, which is completely separate, completely unrelated to Trends. But the main community that people that's like really thriving is part of the Trends product. And the email that I'm referring to is a community email um, from that Facebook group. Yeah, and that's, so that's just paid only. People see yeah. that. Um, so that kind of leads into this next question, which is, does the Hustle have a separate community from the trans community? Is there a free community available as well or just the paid community? Yeah, so I think, so yes, we do. We have the ambassador um, Facebook group. 
Um, but I would say that if you were to compare the two in terms of engagement, involvement, um, the level of quality of posts, the trans community is much better. And that's not because like, you know, we, we did anything that much different with the trans community. I think it actually has to do with, again, this idea that with a paid product and also a product where you're filtering people through information, you're bringing in a certain type of person, right? So you're pre-filtering the people who are coming into the community. And then also something worth mentioning is with a higher price point and charging in general, there's kind of, you know, this mechanism where, um, you know how people often don't finish, finish courses, but if they spend like a thousand dollars on a course, they're more likely to finish it because there's like, they feel like they need to get value out of this thing. I think there's a similar mechanism that happens with the trans community where people have paid 300 bucks for the year and they feel, you know, inclined to want to get value out of it through this Facebook group. And then again, there tends to be higher quality people in there because of that filtering mechanism. And so, yes, there is a free version, the, the ambassador program um, or Facebook group for the hustle. But in terms of engagement, quality of conversation, et cetera, um, the trans community is, is just a lot more thriving. Yeah. And pricing, um, just to clarify that, that, so it's 300 a year. Do you do monthly? Do you see any difference between monthly and yearly? Anything else around pricing that you've tested or seen to be like uh, surprising or yeah, anything? Yeah. So it's interesting. I wasn't around when this decision was made at the very beginning, but from the very beginning, it's been annual only. Um, and a lot of people told Sam, you know, this is a really bad idea. You're like, your conversion rates are going to be horrible. Like you're not offering monthly, like no one's going to sign into this. Um, but our, our numbers are, are great. And we just, because of that, we've just simplified things by saying, you know, only annual subscription. It helps in terms of our like customer service requirements. It helps in terms of actually just having like one um, product to sell right in one way versus having all these convoluted product experiences, upgrades, downgrades, things like that. And so it's worked super well for us. Can't say it would work perfectly for everyone else, but yeah, for us, it's just the annual subscription. Um, we do a $1 14 day trial up to the 299. And then from there, it's just an annual subscription. And just so I understand the business model better, are there other um, products and revenue streams? Cause I think, you know, one of the aspects about community is you can start kind of branching out obviously as as things grow. Um, and so I'm curious, like what the breakdown looks like for the trends and hustle just around like monetization in, in general, or is the trends product, the core kind of product? So the email newsletter is monetized through ads. And, but that's why if you remember at the beginning, I was saying that, you know, there's a ceiling with email newsletters in terms of monetization, at least in terms of just you know, pure play advertising. So many different, so Morning Brew, for example, Morning Brew decided, okay, there's only so far we can get with our main newsletter. We're going to launch verticalized newsletters. So they have like an emerging tech newsletter. So that's way, one way you can expand. We decided instead of that, we're going to go more so like a classic marketing funnel where you have, you know, this big funnel at the top. We do monetize it through advertising. Then below you have more of a back end product, which is trends. But the more we've talked to people, the more we've realized that trends is somewhere in the middle and we need to add like a like a back end back end. Normally, when people refer to back end, it's like thousand dollars plus. Um, probably not a subscription model. Um, so right now, we're in the middle of. Uh, we already launched this, so it's public. But um, we're in the middle of creating our back end, which is these kind of super super in depth guides, um, a mix between content uh, or sorry, written content, vi video content, things like that, um, on specific topics. And the reason we're, we're launching this is because. If you think about, again, like a person and the problems they have and how close you can get to solving problems for them, we consistently found that, you know, people in the daily um, wanted to learn more about, you know, I'm interested in business and tech. How do I actually create my own business? How do I actually operate my business better? Things like that. So we gave them a bunch of ideas with trends, right? We give them like, here's a new industry you can tackle. Here's a tactic that you can use within your business, but still what was missing for a lot of people is they're like, this is great. If anything, I have too many ideas now, but now how do I execute on these ideas? Like, I want to know exactly how to build an email newsletter. I want to know exactly how to enter the pet industry or start a company within the remote workspace. And so what we're doing now with these guides is doing a, you know, pivoting a little bit and going deeper and more so being like, a, here's how you do it, right? Here's everything you need to know to actually get from A to B. Um, and that is kind of going to be, we're, I think we'll launch more products in the future, but at least in, at the moment, the plan is, you know, you have the, f the very, very front end, which is this free newsletter that's monetized through advertising. You have this middle ground subscription product, which is trends. And then 
uh, this back end product, which will be guides. And I think our first one is launching in, I think around a month or so. The date keeps changing, but yeah. Nice. Well, I love the focus on um, solving people's problems and really like starting with that kind of um, understanding or empathy for, you know, who are these people? I think it even speaks back to that first question from Victor around when you enter this other community to sort of bring people over, understand they might already have some solutions from that community that they're uh, that they have. And so maybe look at a product or a different way of kind of bringing value to them in an immediate basis. I think that focus is really smart. I'm switching gears a little bit and then we'll, we'll take another question. Um, let's talk like tactically, um, op- you know, you're in, you're in operations, so you don't even really consider yourself as much of a community manager, although that's part of what you do. Um, let's, let's talk like tactics on like a weekly level. Maybe there's something daily that you're doing. Um, I'd also like to speak about if there's any type of automation or um, other tools that you might be using when you're engaging with or essentially working on building the community for uh, for trends. So yeah, what, what comes to mind is like a, a regular usage uh, or regular activity that um, that you're using. Sure. So the one downside that I should say operationally as it relates to Facebook is that Facebook really, really makes it difficult to automate anything. Um, and so, and they do that, I think, because if you think about um, something like Circle, I actually haven't built a community on Circle myself, but um, I assume that you can like export the people in your community super easily and email them and, and things like that. Facebook wants to own any community on Facebook, basically. And what that means is that you can't set up zaps or you can't automate anything such that, you know, you have a list in whatever platform you're using to sell your product where it basically like zaps people back and forth, removes them when they cancel, things like that. So that part of Facebook is really tedious if in terms of, especially if you're a subscription product like us versus a, you know, a lifetime community per se, where you do have to add people and remove people and that's super tedious. And then people within Facebook may not sign up with Facebook with the same email that they sign up with your product. So that I would say is like definitely, you know, Separate from all the positives that I said about Facebook communities, that is one thing that makes it very operationally hard. So we've had to work a lot on that and, you know, find specific tools that um, still don't let us automate anything, but make it a little bit easier in terms of tracking and actually facilitating that. So that's the first thing. Um, The second thing is, as I mentioned, in our onboarding, we worked pretty hard to make sure that as people are actually getting onboarded, the community is pretty front and center. So, you know, they'll get their email every single week. Uh, during their two-week trial, but our goal is to make sure that A, they join the community during that 14-day trial, and B, that they engage either by, you know, actually posting saying, hey, I'm Steph, I do X, Y, Z, like, here's where I need help, or just seeing, we get a lot of community posts in front of them. We also run um, lectures kind of similar to this, which um, get people to engage you know, in a more face-to-face way. It is a webinar, so similar to, to this, they're not actually meeting other people, but we are actually implementing a monthly kind of live networking thing that'll hopefully get people not just involved in the community, you know, in Facebook, but, you know, more face-to-face um, building those connections. And then within the group itself, I would say, I think compared to other communities, we do less of this like super structured, like I see in a lot of communities, they'll be like, all right, it's Monday, like, here's what we do on Mondays, right? Or, um, hey, everyone, like, here's a here's a thread, post your Twitter followings or things like that. We never do stuff like that. And we more so, again, just consider what's the behavior that we want to promote in this community. And then um, we go and create that. So every, one of the things that we love doing is, again, sharing I, like business ideas when they hit us or whenever we, we do research. So anytime that happens, we'll just go and post it in the community. Um, and again, I think now we've seen other people kind of copy or embody that behavior. Um, so I would like to say that we have more, um, or I would, I would hope that we would have had more kind of like logistical processes, but we honestly don't. And we honestly just focus on kind of providing value for the community and, you know, again, showcasing the type of behavior that we want to see in the community and hoping that other people go and follow suit. Yeah, I want to um, circle up on a few more things related to that, but someone asked, what tools are you using to make the Facebook operations uh, easier? And yeah, if there is any process or any docs you put together, I'm just curious to hear like nitty gritty details and, and some of the specific tools. Yeah, so the tool we use is something called Group Collector. I believe it's a Chrome extension, although I don't actually operate it, so I'm not, but look up Group Collector. Um, and it basically helps you. Again, you can't automate it, so you can't actually have it so that like this person gets added to Facebook and I don't need to do anything. 
you still need to manually go and add it, but Group Collector helps you actually like manage and track all of that. So for example, with trends, since it's an annual subscription, um, we have a Group Collector thing where it's like this month we added these people to Facebook and then we go back, you know, when people are canceling and then we make sure that like of the people we added to Facebook, we go and remove them from Facebook. So again, the adding and the removing is manual, but Group Collector helps you actually track and facilitate that so that you know you're not just kind of aimlessly doing it um and then in terms of the processes yeah like i said it's it's pretty manual i mean we we have lists that get created more automatically from or we use something called woocommerce to actually process our subscriptions but then as it relates to the community adding and subtracting it's it's all manual yeah one other question i have about that um is it sounds like it's a bit serendipitous. And I think there's something interesting about that in that uh, if you kind of just share something when it's on your mind or if you have an exciting idea and you want to just put it in the community, I think people can kind of feel that versus maybe you're continuing to do this structured thing that people aren't responding to or whatever. So yeah. I, I like that approach, but I'm curious how it works with a larger team. Um, are there designated roles or at the hustle and trends? Is it kind of like hey, we're all a part of this community. We should all be chipping in and responding. Like how structured is your work around the community? Because you're, you know, you consider your role more in operations than, than community. Yeah, so it's a good question. And I think um, this is something that we're figuring out now in the sense that up until now, it has been kind of that just post when you have value to share and everyone do that, right? Including Sam, the founder, all the way down to like, if someone is our customer service rep, like if you have value that you can think that you think can benefit or our community can benefit from, go post it um, and also engage in the community as you see fit, right? Again, that idea of just like embodying that behavior that we want other people to actually copy or, or again, embody. So that's the first thing. But then the second is now we're at a point where now we are at a, at a juncture where we do need to start considering, we probably need to have someone on this more full time, probably need to have someone who's more acting as like a moderator versus just a participant in the community, but we're still figuring out how we want to do that without, I think sometimes if you add in too much moderation, too much rule, too much routine, you end up um, kind of not ruining a community, but kind of taking away from the serendipity or the natural engagement that happens within a community. So we're trying to figure that out um, while also kind of acknowledging that we're a growing community. And there are some of these hiccups that we mentioned when you hit scale that probably need someone to be more directly overseeing the community. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I want to give time uh, for anyone else who wants to throw in a question into the chat. Uh, here is one right now with, from Matt. So yeah, just as we, you know, got about 15 more minutes here. So for anyone, definitely would consider throwing your question in to get an answer directly from Steph. Let's start with this one from Matt. What tools do you use for your newsletter product for trends.co? Do you post in multiple places or is it all purely on your own platform? Yeah, so I assume he means like the actual creation of the newsletter. So the hustle daily is all custom, but trends is not. So trends is, we created like an HTML template a year ago. We're actually redesigning it right now. We've gone through multiple products. When it first started, it was just in MailChimp. And then um, MailChimp is actually, you know, I use MailChimp for my own personal newsletter. It's a great place to start because it's just so easy to get started. It obviously like breaks once you start to get a little bigger. So after that, we moved to something called Active Campaign. Um, which has been okay. It's been good for us. It's, it was certainly more customizable and had more functionality than MailChimp. Um, but now we're actually moving away from Active Campaign to a program called Sail Through. The reason that we're pivoting to Sail Through is just um, for both the daily and trends. Sail Through, compared to all these other tools, has a lot more um, kind of customization, specifically around um, someone customize being able to customize. Um, a newsletter to a particular individual. Um, and so something that I would mention though is me saying that we're going to sail through, I think that only really makes sense at scale, right? Because having that level of customization is not needed, especially if you're first starting out. And so we're at a place where, you know, the daily has over a million subscribers and, um, you know, trends has many thousands. And so some of that customization actually does come into play where we can elevate what we're doing and it makes sense. But if you're just starting out and you have, you know, 100 people in your community, I don't think that's something that that makes sense. So if you're starting out, I would just start with something like ConvertKit or MailChimp, something that makes it as easy as possible for you to actually create your newsletter um, instead of using some of these more, I guess, expensive and advanced tools that only really benefit you once you're at scale. 
Awesome. I'm um, going to take the live questions before the circle question. So um, another person asked, are you planning to build a community around the content book you just published? Yeah. So I think they're, they're asking about, uh, so I published a book, it's called Doing Content Right. And it's just, it's a book that I wrote uh, and published a month ago that did super well. And so we have a Telegram chat. And honestly, I remember earlier in this chat, I was saying how different types of platforms service different sizes of communities. And so when I originally was um, selling this book, I only expected to sell a couple hundred copies and you know, only a fraction of those people would actually want to engage in the community. And for that reason, I was like, Telegram's perfect, right? I've been in many Telegram chats where if anything under like 200 people works really, really well. But once you start scaling past that, it breaks down because of that synchronicity that, you know, if you're not paying attention, all of a sudden the Telegram chat has like a hundred messages and you're like, God, I really just don't want to read this. And so to answer your question, there is, I guess, in some form an existing community in that Telegram chat, but I am trying to consider where I would want to potentially move it um, because there are far more people than I think a kind of solid Telegram chat can can handle. And so I'm debating, you know, I've talked a lot about Facebook, so potentially Facebook. Um, also, I've heard great things about um, a platform called Mighty Networks. So I'm potentially considering that as well. Um, but yeah, just trying to think through, um, you know, some of the questions that have been asked in, in this conversation, like which, which platform makes the most sense? What um, level of engagement do I want? How big do I think this community is actually gonna get? Um, and so those are some of the things that I'm toying with, but until I make a decision, I'm just keeping the community on uh, Telegram. Yeah, and I think it speaks to starting small um, because you sort of expected one thing and you're like, Telegram's gonna be perfect. Then another yeah. thing happens and you're like, okay, well maybe we need to switch. And so for people out there who are thinking about getting started, you know, you can just make the jump, start somewhere and maybe it needs to evolve. Um, and at that point you can do that. Um, so there's another question that's kind of similar, and I like that we're kind of focused on your personal work now, because I think it's also, it speaks to that beginning phase again. Um, and I think this question is a little bit similar, and I think I'm going to try to parse this again from Victor on Circle. <laughs> um, it's about side projects, and it's kind of like a personal development question, and says, I've noticed in your manual that you used to struggle with focus on too many ideas, decisiveness, overthinking. I'm in a similar situation, and I'd be happy to hear how you made progress with this. If you have any tips... Um, you know, Victor says, I'm more of an analytical person, you know, more of like versus a developer or implementer, I get stuck exploring and coming up with ideas and doing that on repeat, um, sometimes in short loops, as opposed to pursuing any of the ideas and seeing them through. So uh, yeah, I, I like that we're kind of more on the personal side now. So how do you feel about that personally? What helped you? Um, yeah, anything you want to say there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things I would say here. So one, I think it's really great that you're that like reflective to recognize that you're like kind of an idea nerd and you like bouncing around and scheming. I'm the same way um, where I think that's really, that's like the first step, you know, when people talk about like um, kind of getting past um, roadblocks of your own, like the first step is recognizing what's actually causing those roadblocks. And in your case, it sounds like you've got a lot of ideas and you struggle to execute on them. So great kind of like personal reflection. Um, for me, the things that um, have helped me to kind of get past that are in recognizing that I am kind of like a little ADD sometimes and I wanna create 8 billion things is okay, how do I actually structure uh, my goal setting and my kind of the way that I facilitate projects to actually align with this. I think the problem that most people face is that they try to like um, be like other people or use frameworks that other people use, but other people think differently than them. Like some people actually are much better execution than ideas. And so if you take a framework that works for them or an approach that works for them, it likely won't work for you. And so a couple things that I can mention that have worked in particular for me is try to find projects, for example, that you can take to completion within a very specified amount of time. And so for example, the book is something where I spent years kind of like creating different projects and not, you know, trying to look for some company per se, right? Of like, I'm going to go build some company and maybe I will one day, but at least for now I was, you know, trying to search for this thing because everyone else was doing this thing. And then eventually I was like, I could just create a book in two months and just like really like set a very like specific time constraint and I can do that and I can finish it and it'll be done. And um, that played to my kind of like ADD nature where it's like, I have this, I'm going to focus on it. And then after that, I can go create something else, right? Um, even with this book, even though it's done super well, I've had a bunch of people who are like, are you going to go create like a paid newsletter after? Are you going to go create a course? And like, maybe, but 
I have so many other things I want to create. And so maybe if I was purely maximizing for like wealth creation or, you know, the number of people following me or something like that, maybe I would go and create a course or a paid newsletter. But for me, I've just kind of had the self-reflection that there's so many things I want to go and create. And at least at this juncture, I'm happy to go and kind of like hop around a little bit. And so I would kind of, you know, pose the question to you, what can you build in a short amount of time that you can enjoy building and be happy with it, right? And and kind of, again, play into the nature that that you have instead of trying to fight it. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, within the scope of things that you can create, what is something that you actually could enjoy doing for a very long time? And the way that you can answer that is just, what are you already doing that you do naturally that, um, you know, you've been doing for years without even thinking about it, right? So things like, for me, like I've been, I, I've been writing and blogging without anyone asking me for years. And so that actually sounds like if I were to go and, you know, continue to um, do something more in the long term, it wouldn't be as much of an uphill battle because I wouldn't be fighting something that I don't really want to do on a consistent basis. So what are the things that you actually do naturally when no one's looking, when no one's asking, when you're not trying to make money, and then try to position that in a way that actually can kind of integrate with, with one of your ideas instead of trying to start from this place of like, I want to make money or I want to be successful, start from like, what, what do I actually enjoy doing? What do I do naturally? And what fits within my habits as an individual instead of trying to fight that um, and try to create things that, you know, other people, you know, or try to do things that you see other, work for other people, focus on where your habits actually uh, originate, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love it. It's like two questions. One is sort of a long-term personal alignment and enjoyment, and and then yeah. it's shrinking it down, not making it this huge thing. What can I do in a short amount of time that's successful? And I think um, for community leaders, the same thing. It's like, how do you just get that initial first uh, group um, to be successful? Don't think about how it's going to be way down the road. Um, so let's, let's do one more question, and then we'll kind of sign things off. Cool. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you again, Steph, for sharing all this wisdom. We also, um, in the chat is, uh, her book, uh, which is on Gumroad. So you can see a link to that. Thanks. Um, I'm definitely gonna go check that out right after this. So, uh, let's, let's make this the last question. Um, so basically, uh, I'm starting, starting out with building a community and it's still a side project without structured member acquisition. Do you have any advice for how to generate word of mouth promotion, uh, to reach the right people and grow the community in its early phase? So yeah, I think just speaking about word of mouth, um, and getting other people to speak about your products. Yeah. So I think I actually talk about this in my book because I think it spans not just communities, but like written products or just products, companies overall, where the issue that I very consistently see is, okay, first of all, someone who is going to go talk about your product needs to use your product. That sounds obvious, but how do you make sure that people are actually utilizing your product or your community in the first place and getting extreme value out of it? And when I mean extreme value, it's the sense of, if you imagine all the things that exist in the world, only the top, you know, 1% are actually going to be shared, especially word of mouth shared, right? Because for you to go and, you know, across the like hundreds or thousands of products that you engage with on in a given month, you're only going to tell your friends about maybe one or two of those, right? And so your thing needs to stand out. And the place that people normally go astray or misunderstand about standing out is when they think about their product, they're like, I'm going to create, um, for example, a newsletter about tech. They talk about what they're creating not how it's better. And what I mean by this is, I'll use the example of content, but I think it's true with communities, is if when you go and tell your friends about a newsletter, you're not saying, hey, I found this great newsletter, it writes about microchips. You're not saying, I found this great newsletter, it, like, it talks about women in tech. You're saying, I found this great newsletter and it's super funny, or it's super short and it saves me time, or uh, it has these great visuals and they just like represent things better than I've ever seen before. Right. So they're talking about how something is being done. And the same thing is true within a community. Someone's like, wow, this is like the highest quality community I've ever been a part of. Or like, I've just like, I've found my like people, right? Like I've never been in a community where I feel like I've, you know, I'm around people who are so much like me. Um, and so think about what's your thing. What's, what's actually the thing that would make someone want to talk about your community. It's often not actually the content or the topic of your community, right? It's actually like, what is better about it? Right. So if you want to actually get someone, especially with word of mouth, to talk about your community, your newsletter, your product, consider what your I talk in the book, I say it's like your edge. 
right? What's your edge? If you can't actually identify what your edge is, then that means you probably don't have one. And therefore it's very unlikely that someone's going to go out of their way and talk about your product. Cause even if it's good, even if it's like, you know, above average, no one talks about above average stuff. They only talk about the best stuff that's significantly better um, than what exists out there currently. And so if you're building a community, ask yourself that question, be honest with yourself. Am I creating a pr pretty good community or am I creating a really great community? And the final thing I would add here is another way that people kind of misunderstand this is they're like, they try to be the average of a bunch of things. Um, and what I mean by this is they try to be like, you know, pretty high quality and at a pretty good pr price point and, you know, with a pretty good alignment in terms of topics. And people don't care about being the average of all the things that you care about. They care about one specific thing. That one specific thing can differ depending on the product. But the example that I give in the book is Costco. So if you think about retail overall, um, Costco went into an extremely competitive space, general retail against Walmart, Target, all these other companies. Costco has blown them out of the water, at least in terms of growth over the last decade. And why? Because all these other companies, again, try to be pretty good at certain things. They try to have like relatively good prices, relatively good in-store experience, relatively good service. Um, whereas Costco, they were like, okay, what's one thing that at least some cohort of users care about? And for Costco is cost, right? I, I, you forget that Costco literally has the word cost in their name and they did everything they possibly could to trade on cost, right? To be the absolute cheapest for products and they ignored everything else. So if you think about Costco, their packages are huge. No one wants a four pack of, of Q-tips. Their in-store experience, it's like a factory. It's hard to get to their stores. When has anyone ever helped you in a Costco? But if you can find one thing that people care about, whether it's again with a product or within a community and you become the best at doing that one thing, even if it means sacrificing certain other things, that's when you can um, get users and also, again, get users to talk about you. When has anyone ever recommended Walmart? They haven't, but you consistently say like, oh, I went to Costco and like found this amazing price for Starbucks coffee that like is like half of what it is at, at Walmart. So anyway, I kind of went on a little bit of a rant there, but I think that's really important with whether, no matter what kind of product that you're building is that you understand what your edge is and make sure that you're better in one very, very, very concrete way. And um, you're better, again, not across the like average of things, but in that one aspect and you become the best there. And that is when people will start to talk about whatever your offering is. Amazing. I think that's a, a wonderful place to leave it. There's so many gems. I wish I'd been writing down some of the quotes. <laughs> um, this, uh, this is going to be available for replay. So if anyone wants to you know, rewatch this later, members will be able to check that out. Um, Matt says, uh, love the answer to the last question. Tell, tell people about why they should care about the content and tell people about what it contains. Um, yeah, and there's just so many, I think the perceived value conversation was really interesting. And I just think your focus on really delivering, um, you know, really thinking about who might be buying and why, I think that's that's one of the biggest takeaways or who might be joining your community and why and what value you can, you can create um, for them to, to curate the community. So uh, Steph, thank you so much. There are many sure. more sessions um, coming up as part of this community program. Thanks everybody for tuning in and hanging out. Um, I don't know if you want to tell people about where else they can find you. Obviously there's, I think it's trends.co. Is it the hustle.com? It's the hustle.co and trends.co. Yeah. The hustle.co um, trends.co. And then you personally, where, where all, yeah. Are exactly. You so I think that, yeah, the, I just wrote a book. The Gumroad link is in the chat. You can also find it at doingcontentright.com. And then the most active place I am is on Twitter. Um, my handle is stephsmithio because my site is stephsmith.io. So yeah, if you want to reach out, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to DM me um, and would be happy to chat. Nice. And this recording will be up, uh, I believe, shortly. So yeah, thanks again, Steph. Thanks, everybody. And see thanks, you in everybody. the next uh, session. All right. See ya.